Hello, everybody, and welcome to NAC TV's Coffee Chat. With me today, my guest is Dan Mazur, our Member of Parliament for Dauphin, Swan River, and Nipawa, but soon to be changed, I hear, or mm -hmm. at least that's in the, in the yeah. pipes. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, Don. Good to see you. Pleasure it's, to be here. Well, I'm well, glad because it. it's hard to pinpoint you when you're busy <laughs> at caucus and doing all sorts of things like that. Yeah. Summertime, you sort of land here and move around your constituency. So um, I'm going to get right to it. Sure. Okay. That's good. Um, I'm, um, your bill mm -hmm. to hold the internet companies accountable for the speeds they sell Canadians passed through Parliament. Yes. And is now law, which congratulations on Thank that. You. Well done. Thank you. Um, so, can you take some time to talk about this accomplishment and what it really means for us as Canadians, for me as a consumer? Yeah, so Bill 288, it's um, right now internet service providers can sell you a theoretical speed or like up to speeds. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not really, it's not what you expected speeds, right? Like, or, or what you can expect. So um, that leads to, to issues like as far as what your expectations are, right? Mm -hmm. So just imagine, I use the analogy going to fill up your, uh, your car, right? So you want up to 50 liters of fuel, you only get 10 liters, but you're paying for 50 liters. And the telecommunications markets uh, companies are the only ones that can sell a service to a consumer like that in, in Canada. So my bill actually addresses that. So the, what the ISPs, internet service providers, they have to be more transparent on what service uh, you can expect while using the internet. And that could be anything from speeds, that could be anything from uh, time of day. Like there's a whole bunch of different criteria that they, they can help to differentiate you. But the ultimate goal is to, to so the consumer is better armed with information of what kind of service they can expect. So it's not changing the service dynamic, but it's providing better information to you. Because I know that they'll say we can do up to, let's say, 100 whatever. Yeah. But they bring you in, to get 100, you have to pay a lot more than if they bring you in at 50. Right. Um, so you're saying it's that kind of thing as opposed to here's what you get for this. Yeah. And it and it really allows you to have a conversation with your with your service provider because you might not need a hundred, you might only need thirty, and why would you pay for the extra twenty right and all the other extra costs? And they can sell it to you. It's up to it's when it works for them. So you know, remember back in COVID, like you saw yeah. the wheel spinning yes. around. That was them controlling because the the systems, especially in rural Canada, they're not as robust. They're not as big right so they get oversubscribed mm -hmm. everything slows down seven eight o'clock at night and, and if you're a business well you need your you need your internet when you need your internet right yes. but if you're watching a movie but like meanwhile you're paying you're paying top dollar for the service but uh, you meanwhile might you're not, not get it you're not getting not, it you're not guaranteed right so the bill talks about that uh is there anything in the in the in the, in the works do you think for well, we can go seven clicks out of Nipawa and lose internet service. We don't cell have service. cell cell yeah. service. You know, yeah. there are things like that, as well as competition. We're limited to who provides well, internet service. Right. So this would actually uh, increase competition because anytime you have to be more transparent in, in what you're actually selling them for service. Right now, you can't tell the difference. Like no mm -hmm. one can differentiate themselves because they all sell 10, 50. Government said you shall sell, that's going to be a Canadian standard. So, okay, we sell ten, up to 10 and 50, right? That, this bill actually addresses that. If they cannot provide that service, they can't. Uh, they can't advertise that, right? And if they get found out, well, there is actually teeth in the, like, in the act anyway. So, so there is some good. sort of uh, uh, sc that, scrutiny yeah. and, and, and yeah. Uh, consequence. Yeah. yeah. And anything. to answer your, so this has been done in, we had the advantage, Australia did this uh, years ago, actually, 2017, and then they did a review of this bill, this type of bill, yes. and it actually worked. It did, inc it, it decreased, uh, like it did increase competition because it brought down costs, because people were now paying for the service that they actually needed because they understood what they were being sold, but it also uh, inc uh, decreased complaints. Because all of a sudden the expectations, they, everybody knew what their service were buying. And they got what they expected. So, yeah, so you, it's hard to complain when you get what you expected. Right, right. So that was the, the biggest benefit. 
uh, U.S. has gone to a different type of, they're just switching now uh, with this legislation, but they put that in the same type of mandate as well a couple of years ago. So um, I think it'll be great things. And uh, from what I understand of it, the regulator, the CRTC, is working on it right now to, to make this legislation go through. So Excellent. Well, yeah. that's good to know it's because good. competition is becoming more an issue. Yeah. Look at our airlines. We're locked in domestic flights, and there is no competition. Right. Yeah. And I'm seeing a lot of that in the news. So it's similar here. And, yeah. and because the world has now moved to the Internet, and yeah. so more and more and more, we're dependent on it. Look at all the, the average everyday operations that would fold if there was no Internet. Yeah. Suddenly their cash register went yeah. down or you couldn't pump gas at the, the gas station because it's all computerized. So it's, 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 it's it, a critical, it's critical service. It's becoming part of our lives, right? Yes. It, it's like the way we inform it's the way we communicate it's like having a telephone line yes like and uh especially internet like then cell phones they're a different animal and we were we were debating what to go after when we were writing this legislation okay. up uh two years ago but uh, we decided to go with the internet service providers but now we are going to be focusing on the summer for on cell phone service i know we, we do need competition uh but again it goes back to the service like one one thing that's really quite frustrating is how cell phone companies will say we cover a certain area and meanwhile there's no signal right like and to me that's a practice that needs to stop yeah so i don't know we can go back and look at the legislation whether this could be applied to cell phones i don't know um but that's at least well, the framework's there because they're they're becoming so so many more people are just on their phones yes they're doing yeah. everything on their phones yeah. they're not laptop they're not desktop you know, uh, even even pads aren't aren't being yeah. used as much. So many people are doing that. Interesting thing, they're under different legislation though. So they uh, like fixed wireless. This is what this legislation focused on. Yes. So that's why it's internet service providers. So if you're in a house, a fixed location, that's what this legislation addresses. Okay. Thank you. Um, the federal liberal government recently announced that uh, they're going to be increasing the capital gains tax inclusion rate for them from 50% to to uh, 66%. So your party uh, was against the tax hike. Mm -hmm. um, so talk to me about that. Why were you opposed? What, what don't you think it's meeting? What, 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 uh, what do you think its intent was and what is the reality? Well, so capital gains, I, and everybody says, well, it's, it's only for the rich people. It was more, the way the government sold it like the liberal government on purposely said look at this is only the top 0.8 percent that's going to actually impact them For, uh, forget it was less mm -hmm. than one percent right of the population and that's per year so they were already starting to like twist the words around and you had to be very careful in listening to what they were actually saying right it wasn't in it was incorrect it wasn't that there was wrong but it was only for one year everybody that sells uh, some kind of property or some kind of asset. That's what capital gains are applied to. Yeah. And when you make money on that asset, that's a gain, so a capital gain. That's how, how that all works. The problem is, for this, anytime you start talking about capital gains, it also impacts uh, private businesses, especially private corporations. So like your doctor, your dentist, your plumber, your electrician, all these small businesses, many farmers, are all set up as private corporations. That, inside of that, that is, so you're basically, and they have no pension plans, right? A, mm. lot, of the, a lot of these instances, these businesses are, they have their business, is their part of their pension. When they retire, they sell off the business, and they'll have a gain. Mm -hmm. But you're actually, this is a direct attack on your pension on your savings on your life savings so people that were they've they've worked all their life and they knew that they were going to pay 50 percent capital gains on on their business when they when they retired or when they sold off some shares or something like that the liberals are trying to minimize it and saying oh this isn't going to impact only the rich people well you name like this is actually an attack on the middle class on the on the working person that went out on this, on themselves put everything at risk, lived a lifestyle of serving, basically, you know, electrical contractor, mm -hmm. I'll say, I'll, 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 I'll mention them at the first. Like, I mean, the, all these tradespeople, they're set up with private businesses. 
never mind about the farmers, and they, they had this nest egg. They've been putting away for it, so, so they retire. And now the government's come in and said, no, nah, we're going to change the rules. We're going to take 16% more than that. Then we, we're going to take a 50% of, of, mm -hmm. of, of the amount over, right? But now we're going to take another 16% on you. Just have, have a nice day. Two questions related. One, you said it was only for a year that they're doing well, this? Well, the, the numbers they were talking about was only for a year. Ah. But meanwhile, but it's going to impact anybody that's selling their private business and have it again. Selling a cottage that you happen to inherit or happen to, it was in the family and you decide to sell it and retire with it. So, so anything, anything you had a, for a, an asset and decide to sell, like you were, you knew what you're gonna do when you're older, any, any anytime. So, so if you were in business for 25 years and yep. you've been planning for the 50%, there is no grandfather clause. You're automatically hit with, so it's right across the board, 66%. Yep. So what sort of feedback have you been getting from individuals who that will impact? Because well, as you said, it could impact me. I could get an inheritance, yeah. sell that off, and I'm gonna be paying a capital gains tax. So the where it is really gets quite concerning like so they of course Canadians generally you, you think about that right like mm -hmm. they're mad they're frustrated any any businessman anybody's worked all their life here's the rules of engagement right you come work in Canada you get ahead you got a good retirement you you've got a plan right government changes the rules that doesn't make anybody happy I mentioned doctors and a lot of people don't realize this doctors are set up as private corps as well they don't have their own pension plan Dennis, same way, mm -hmm. uh, and they like so. But dentists or doctors have a choice. So if y if you think about this, right? So you get a young graduate come out, or a doctor comes in from somewhere else. We don't have any doctors, but they're getting all of a sudden another sixteen percent capital gains hike, tax hike on them, versus going to the states or going to Europe mm -hmm. or going to wherever else, where the where the tax system is a little bit friendlier for doctors. Well, then that puts that all at risk, right? Mm -hmm. So this is that th it's it's not only attacking the, the the normal like the you know the working citizen, mm -hmm. it's actually attacking our, our our healthcare system as well at the same time. Question it puts it at risk. Yeah, uh, I, I can see what you're saying. So, um, what do you understand the rationale to be for going from the fifty to sixteen percent? Because there must have been some kind of reasoning for it to say we're either paying off this or adding to that or well they sold it as we're we're going after the rich that's how they sold it and i the, meanwhile the consequences and this that's one of the reasons i uh, you know as your elected representative i always always think well what does this mean to the people i represent mm -hmm. right and went the, back to the constituency and it's uh, obviously they didn't understand what they were doing so either the minister of finance didn't understand it or some bureaucrat didn't understand it i i don't know but it the impacts are far and wide why they did it though they've got a spending habit and they got to pay for this deficit somehow mm -hmm. so they thought they would just kind of put it out there and and it would go go away yeah the, the impact on just a regular person uh modest income suddenly gets an inheritance sees an opportunity to augment or yeah. education funds for their kids or whatever that's exactly uh, right the impact is much different than it would have been just a few months ago that's right that's exactly right Dave. okay um now this very intrigued with this 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 uh, the net zero accelerator fund. Ah. Um, what is up with that? What is that? <laughs> what is what was that intended to be, and what's happening? Okay, so it was net zero accelerator fund. It was in a whole host of projects. the The fund was um, created for Canada's heaviest emitters to reduce emissions. So there was, there was a fund created. They would give out uh, monies for projects. To reduce emissions for our projects heavier. to these companies to that these are emitting. Companies, so right. this is this heaviest would be emitters. Yeah, the so big would companies. Be, th they they would get money to right. to right. reduce. Right. That was that was the whole mission. So to net zero. So net zero accelerator mm -hmm. fund. So net zero, really fast, so you can get down to the net zero or like mm -hmm. reduce emissions. Right. So as we an eight billion dollar fund, 
one of the biggest funds that we've come across yet in, in as far as when it comes to environment and climate change in the in the projects and it was with industry as well but that that doesn't matter the environment minister was in his mandate letter was given a mandate to work with the industry minister to create this fund and reduce emissions and give this money to the Canada's heavy submitters well so we as we got looking into it uh, and then the auditor general the environment commissioner uh, came out with a scathing report and in this report this is about I think three months ago now maybe four uh, they found uh, potential for double counting over estimating how many actually emissions were going to be reduced but the real kicker was over 70 percent of the projects that were let out uh, like were uh, given out uh, gave no commitment to reduce emissions for eight billion dollars so what was the criteria for for receiving so that's the next question we asked Dave we said so what is the target what is the target of this fund and they wrote back that is cabin of confidence we can't tell you so let's let's take a step back if it were operated according to what we would have perceived to be uh, reasonable guidelines yeah yep. is this a, a reasonable approach well, we don't know but they won't tell us the criteria it's cabinet com it's it's, it's a government secret this is a f and it, look at the look my videos up on on youtube it is it is bizarre they will not this is unheard of there's 4.5 billion dollars spent right now we have the list of companies that are like committed and out the door and we don't know how many they won't tell us what the emissions uh reductions is going to be from that 4.5 billion dollars so far and no and they won't tell us the target they won't tell us whether they they were one of the companies that gave no commitment to reduce emissions they'll just tell us that here we gave company x 800 million dollars and they're we're finding out there's many of them are foreign companies and multi-billion dollar companies part of this part of the reason for the eight so these aren't focused on canadian companies then not related to our emissions we're sending in theory we're sending money out of the country eight billion dollars of taxpayer dollars and they're saying it's cabinet confidence we can't tell you how many what our target was what we deal we we made with these guys to say how many emissions are going to be reduced so really what you need now is full disclosure and that's what we're asking for interesting okay um the carbon tax mm -hmm. uh, it's a very interesting concept here's a question for you yeah okay What's the carbon tax applied to? When would you pay a carbon tax? I suppose if I were emitting carbon um, over an agreed upon or agreed upon limit no, or something for like you, that. No, for you, you yourself. For me, for carbon yeah, tax. Yeah, when would you pay a carbon tax? Or a normal, normal myself? Well, if we're looking at things that produce carbon, all right, uh, heating, uh, electricity, mm -hmm. Heating, vehicle uh, not electricity oh, well electricity if it's produced by uh, coal or coal. gas yeah. right um, what about if it's produced by nuclear power zero emissions okay so you wouldn't pay a carbon like we don't pay a carbon tax on electricity in manitoba right yeah as a hydro yeah but we do pay carbon tax on natural gas yes propane yeah. diesel and then we we pay a carbon tax it's b baked into our um, fuel that we use diesel yeah. and gasoline um, um, hospitals pay a carbon tax to heat their buildings. Um, municipal buildings the, they they pay a carbon tax. Well, schools pay a carbon tax. What about uh, 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 an organization? Uh, well, co-op. This, pay place, a this, this place, place here. This place, please. If they use natural gas or if they use propane, they're going to be any type of carbon-based carbon yeah. uh, fuel okay. to heat their home, to heat their their property. So you've been reaching out to. Uh, your constituents yeah and you've been touching base with with uh, things like municipalities school boards that kind to get I, I'm yeah. gathering to get a sense of it so what's been the uptake and and uh, so what kind of feedback have you had interesting so Alberta so we'll just talk briefly about school boards Alberta school boards came out with a, 
a statement. Like they oh, right across Alberta, they saw the, the the complete hypocrisy of this thing, and they said, "Look at our tax dollars for education should be focused on educating children and not paying a carbon tax to the to the federal government." Right. So they they put a like a edict out, mm -hmm. right, saying we're opposed to the carbon tax. Talking to Manitoba, it's been it's been crickets. They will not. I've asked schools, I've asked school boards to go and just pull one bill and go see what you're paying one month in a carbon tax. And I have, I have no responses from the schools. Not one. There's six school divisions, not one response. So your ask was simply tell me how much you're paying on a just monthly a, bill yeah. on, on carbon tax. What are you looking yeah. for a percentage or you're looking for dollars? Uh, well, just show me your bill. Like, uh, if you're paying. You know, sh show me your bill, how much you're paying on carbon tax. You can go anywhere you want. Once you realize, a lot of people don't realize they're paying it. Th th when we started this conversation four years ago, it was municipalities and lots of schools too. And like, we don't, e A, we don't track it or we don't pay any. And the reality is they do. <laughs> they started off really, really s s low, right? Mm -hmm. They started off at $25 a ton. Here's, here's the worst thing about this. So right now we're at a point where if you spend $100 on natural gas, mm -hmm. you spend $100 in carbon tax. And that was before the 23% increase on April 1st. So it's, it's a parity right now. So for And they are talking about quadrupling the carbon tax in the next five years. Well, the interesting thing I find is, okay, so I don't realize what carbon tax I'm paying, but I get a rebate in the mail. But do you, yes. So do you use natural gas to heat your home? Yes. You should look at your bill. See, that, that is your... <laughs> but I, I know my you, bill. My bill's so changed very little. Then I'll, when we started this conversation, though, like, you, in this here, we're going to ask the carbon tax, oh, we got to do something, Dan. We got to do something. So you're, you're willing to not know what you're paying for a carbon tax, but you know you're getting something back. Like... To, like that's got to change, right? If we're really going to address climate change, that has to change. Is like, now on your bill? I, I mean, I'm going to go take a look at my bill. But um, does it say carbon tax cost? It'll. Um, I think it's federal carbon tax or carbon levy. It's different. Okay. In, it, uh, the word we carbon will off. be there. Yeah, like there'll be a, it'll be a charge all to itself, and it should be just around. So your, they're charging me, and then they're giving me money back. But nowhere near. You you will find okay. it's nowhere near. Oh, it's interesting. It's an exercise. I'll, because yeah, you're, you're right. Lots of us don't know that. And so. that's just your house. because And nowhere near because your tax dollars also heat the school, also heat the yes, hospital. Yes, that's true enough. Yes. Also heat the, the local pool, right? So it, it's, it's way more than that. And here it is. So if you're paying $50 a month, say in the dead of winter, for your energy bill mm -hmm. to heat your house right now, there's a $50 carbon tax right across it, so it's a total of 100. It's going to quadruple in the next five years. That's a liberal promise. That's that's they're they're making no bones about it. So when we say $170 a ton, that's what that so direct cost to you. All right. So explain to me then. So we're paying carbon tax. Mm -hmm. We get a rebate. What's the point of paying tar carbon tax if we're getting a rebate? Where is that tax actually going to? If it's not doing anything productive about reducing the carbon imprint, where where does it go to? Good question. We've been asking that for the last four years. Okay. And what would what, would, what would be an alternative then to, so the, to the carbon tax? How do we how do we capture what carbon impact is on our country? So and how do we capture then what is the impact on us individually? And and then what do we do about it? So this is an energy energy usage discussion right yes so it's and if it's carbon based like it, so the history of energy is like we started off to heat our homes very simple mm -hmm. we, to heat our homes we use well, wood in this country you you need to be wood able to have or heat. dung yeah. or like you need yeah. like you it was a very open source of type and a very and not not that kind of carbon friendly type of Mm -hmm. uh, emission. There was lots of emissions from our very early forms of energy mm -hmm. and then we moved to coal and then we moved to oil and now we're going to natural gas and every one of those every types of those energies that came in are always cleaner and more energy dense right so less emissions that's what like what the next generation of energy is I don't know but right now I know that 
uh, Canada's trying to be the last Boy Scout, basically, and saying, here, you all have to pay a carbon tax so we can save the world and reduce emissions. And by the way, Don, the government, we asked the question, so how many emissions are directly reduced from the carbon tax? I wrote a letter to the, to the environment minister. He replied in a written letter, we do not measure the emissions reduced from the carbon tax. Well, that's an interesting response. So I've questioned him on, on, so that's why I'm asking for his resignation. But I mean, out of all this stuff, so we got an $8 billion slush fund going on, we, mm -hmm. net zero accelerator fund, right? We've got this carbon tax, is, they're going to quadruple mm -hmm. and tax every one of us just to live in Canada and they don't measure the results. Interesting. So that's why you were asking and that's, looking for that. And that's why we want to ask the tax. And then, okay. and then as far as, and we say technology, not taxes, the way I, like, I'm not going to burn more, like the, the energy efficiency part of it, that makes sense. Of course, the less carbon you use, the less, uh, the less it's emitted, right? That's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's, there's, it's, it's well, really silly, the amount of emissions we've reduced, even our cars. Remember back in the 70s, right? We didn't have catalytic converters mm -hmm. and California brought in all these emissions controls and people were losing their minds. We never lost the ability to have a gas motor though. Like we pulled lead out of the fuel. Mm -hmm. We made it all safer, that, right? Yes. We made it all a lot, lot cleaner. Uh, we're definitely not changing the oils as much. They've better lubricants and all that. That was all natural succession. Now it had really nothing to do with the emissions. These guys are talking about throwing away the carbon, uh, the internal combustion uh, engine, making all electrical cars, and uh, like th there's some, there's some real radical yeah. mandates that are being proposed by this government that just that are not acceptable and not good for our country. The one aspect, though, that one has to put in perspective as well, is while those things were done, and I remember those, the lead, the catalytic converters, all of that kind of thing. When you compare the number of vehicles on the road now to then, mm -hmm. or even 10 years ago, um, you have more of them on the, on the road. So by just mathematics, you're gonna see more of those uh, kinds of emissions come yeah. out just by volume. Yes, yeah, because uh, we are using more energy to move around and we're, we're more productive though too. But I bet you per gigajoule per liter of like the energy intensity or the carbon intensity. Mm -hmm. They talk lots about that. And uh, we are definitely like, even you look at the oil sands productions, all those are dropping naturally anyways. Cause they, they, that means they're doing it more efficiently, which is costing less, which is better for the consumer and better for the shareholder. So if you take a look at it, okay, we, we this is what's currently happening. Um, now, we know an election is coming up, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but the bottom line is, if the Conservatives got into power, how would they address that? How would they take a look at uh, some sense of either quantifying, well, they'd have to if we're missing that, quantifying the number of carbon emissions, but then what would, what would be the, the approach, do you think, to address it other than a carbon tax? Well, technology. Technology, not taxes. That's the first one. So that's very so high level. We'll talk about technology. Like so, m putting scrubbers in, like uh, having regulations where they they uh, where companies can be more efficient in what they mm -hmm. do to produce X energy, right? But the biggest, like you know, one of the biggest benefits we can do is actually sell our clean energy to other countries. Right now, we have a, a prime minister and a liberal government that is saying, no, there's no business case to be made in Canada. We're, we're not selling our natural gas. They, they told Japan to go pound salt, have a nice day. They, now that we're starting to have this li liquid natural gas, they told Germany, there's no business case for here. They, you, you don't, we can't sell you any more like, off the East Coast. We have natural gas all around, our, all of the Canada's blessed with this clean energy from f f that we should be selling the rest of the world. That would displace the oil that's being burnt somewhere else. That is displaced the coal that is displaced. That would displace the energy that Russia is selling to Japan. We, if we decided to sell our natural resources 
and clean up the world. That so there would is have a business far, case for that. There's, and there's a far greater positive impact in getting their emissions down because they emit much more than versus our 1.5% of global emissions in Canada here. So what would be our cost in terms of, because clearly if that's not happening, then there's no sort of mechanism in place to really do that. Is there one that could be revitalized or would it have to be a brand new mechanism to look at if we're going to sell our clean energy? Well, that, and so country? liquefied natural gas, that is the, the ships are already switched over to, uh, used to, you see the smokestacks coming out of ships on the coast mm -hmm. and that, they've, all, they've switched over to liquid uh, natural gas. And they, they actually had a port, that was out in BC, it was uh, kind of interesting. They... Um, I think it was 15 or 16, they were looking at putting a fueling port mm -hmm. in the port of Vancouver um, back then. And then we got all tied up with this. We can't put a pipeline in and we can't do this and that. We got into the red tape and then uh, some environmental regulations from the federal government. Meanwhile, Portland turns around and puts a f fueling station in and they just go down there and fill up first and then come up to Canada to get their goods. But w it was a lost opportunity. They're gonna get it in. 10 years later, but I mean, uh, these are the kind of opportunities that have uh, been, um, you know, denied of us in le at least in the last uh, eight years because of their, um, the whole mantra about we got to shut down the oil and gas industry and, and uh, we're, we're not selling our, mm -hmm. our natural resources. Um, gonna switch a bit. Okay. We know that there's an election coming within the next 12 to 18 months, yeah. right? Yeah. It's due. Um, there was a recent by-election in Toronto this week. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the results were a bit surprising, or not a bit surprising, probably yeah. surprising for a lot of people. Um, your reflection on that. What well, does that imply? Does well, it imply anything, really? We, we knew it was going to be close, and I don't think it either, either side um, really didn't know. Like, we were approaching it as we knew it was a liberal stronghold. So really, like, if we were going to throw it over, like, I mean, even a close race, like, in, in talking to colleagues and people that were on the on the ground there, like, you know, they were, even to have a close race would send a clear signal. But to have a win is a game changer. because. So what signal does it say, do you think? Well, people are just tired of the government. Like, I mean, they, they're... They're finally seeing through Justin Trudeau, our prime minister. That was, if you look at any of the TV, like, you know, people on the street kind of thing, and Trudeau's got to go, Trudeau, we're tired of Trudeau, we're trying, like, there's, you know, in the liberal policies, like, the country's in an affordability crisis, housing crisis. You look at Toronto, it's one of the most expensive places on earth to own a house. Well, that leads me into another question. So, you know, like, their, their policies have not helped the average Canadian. So, so when we take, of course they're mad. Take it well. Okay, fair enough. I hear what you're saying, and and I've certainly seen some, a lot of that kind of feedback on on social media and a variety mm -hmm. of things. Um, let's talk about housing. Um, given that housing, I mean, right across the world, but certainly right across our country, yeah. and we'll talk about our country. Housing is a a premium issue. Affordable housing. People who at one point were raised they could assume they were going to be able to buy their own house. That's becoming less and less of a reality. Yeah. We're looking at more condensed, dense, denser populations, especially in the urban areas. You know, living in condos, living in apartments, that kind of thing. How would you see, uh, if your government comes into power, what would be two of the first things you might consider doing with regards to addressing this housing issue? Well, and I, I know uh, our leaders talked about like getting rid of the gatekeepers like it it takes a million dollars just to start building a house and out in bc with all the variances and all the development mm. fees and all that kind of stuff there is a mountain of paperwork and bureaucracy to go through in canada pick your place that is there's no need for and uh, that's that's step one we're going to remove the gatekeepers so people can just get back to building houses. So if they want to build a house, how do we do that? Like there's there's fees right now in Manitoba that like you there's a lot for sale and the, the local RM can instead of putting an incentive in say, here it's like, you know, ten thousand dollars to hook up the water or whatever like that, 
$100,000 to provide you with services and then we'll come talk, right? Like before you even buy the land, like there's things like that that go on and not even met, like all across Canada, right? So the local local RMs have to have be on board with this. And I so we've got 38 municipalities. I've asked when I meet with the RMs, I ask them what is your housing plan? One of the biggest and it, and it's a different different subject in rural mm -hmm. municipalities yes. versus versus yes. urban, right? But one of the it's it's infrastructure, it's uh, wastewater management. Like what are we going to do with our sewage and lagoons? Like and that's every every town every village and again the provincial jurisdictions they, they've moved the, the the scale up uh on, on dumping raw sewage to wherever mm -hmm. they got to do it or handling it right so then the whole infrastructure has got to upgrade in comes the federal government but you can have all the people you want right but if you don't have enough infrastructure to support it you're kind of you're kind of stuck in between the chicken and egg right so, so you're suggesting looking at that process where there's that oversight that isn't necessarily essential, that creates additional costs. Right. Like um, a, there, and, and we've got some, some communities complain about there's, we don't have enough space. And I don't know, like you don't have to look too far outside of Nipah. There's, there's plenty of space. It's, it's got to be that will to say we're going to put in a lot, we're going to bring in a developer, we're going to put in another 50 houses or whatever mm -hmm. you need, right? Like, I mean, Nipah, you're, you're very fortunate to be living in Nipah, actually, because it's uh, one of the, it's the 13th fastest growing city in Canada and third fastest in Manitoba. And I think, the, you know, the council's done a really good job in keeping ahead of it, but there, there is need. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as soon as you get that supply thing kind of figured out, I, it won't take much to turn the rest of it around so people can afford things. But you know again if the jobs are out here and once they realize that it's maybe not affordable in in um you know nipua but brookdale's got homes like or you know out in the country like we got lots of options once you get people out here mm -hmm. so then that goes back to the internet well, discussion and that goes back what else do we offer out here? if we're looking at opening a hospital at, at potentially double the capacity yeah. with a dramatic increase in the health care professional workers that we're going to need there Housing is one yeah. of those things. So yeah. it, it is very critical, and it's critical everywhere. Yeah. Um, defense spending. Oh, yes. I recently saw a senator from uh, on a, a, who's part of a bipartisan committee, and I think there's some perhaps some Canadian people as well on it, talking about Canada's record on defense spending. We currently spend around 1.4%. Our target is supposed to be 2%. Um, there has obviously been challenges for whatever reason to get to that 2%. Uh, and ca Canada is rated as one of the lowest of the partners. And there's a multitude yeah. of different kinds of, of uh, uh, countries involved in this, whether it's NATO or NORAD, NORAD specifically. What would a conservative government do for that? That, that will come along. Well, we've got a productivity problem in Canada, right? Like our productivity is... So gross domestic product. Yes, we are we are drastically struggling to get productivity happening in in Canada, and that goes from house building to ship building to building anything like creating new products in Canada. Is every every turn or every corner you go around, there's another bureaucracy standing in your way. There's another barrier that's like the whole system's just muddied up. So that's why we say we get rid of the barriers, get our production back up, and then the, the, the military spending will come along with that. And it, does that mean letting out more contracts so we get our, our uh, Navy back in, in mm. order? Probably. But I mean, until we get our productivity under control and our spending. Like, you I mean, we, 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 we just, uh, the Liberals just approved a budget and the NDP, a $50 billion deficit spending. And meanwhile, we're still lagging in military spending. $50 billion <laughs> like, like in deficit spending. And yet, we, I don't know. In fact, I think our, our spending in military went down last budget. So when you, or it didn't increase a heck of a lot. I know that for sure. So, you know, I think it's just a matter of the government picking it as a priority and saying, this is what we need to spend. And how do you make it happen? And I, and I think Canadians are ready for it. I, I know our government's ready for it because we've got, the world has changed, right? Yes, it, it was has. 
it was it changed a lot when Russia invaded Ukraine. That's what everybody kind of started going. Hmm. Okay, we got we got to think of these mm -hmm. things different. But then then we have the troubles in the Middle East, right? And then I think that's the real kind of game changer that where everybody's going. Okay, well we got to get back serious about our our military spending. So the the conversation's coming back around to that that we need to do something as a country. You mentioned it a few times, and I'm sort of really getting the sense that. Uh, we're underproducing our productivity, and part of that is because there are so many uh, pathways that people need to go through in order to be productive. Yeah. Um, and then that, never mind about getting taxed to heat your home. So you're, even, you're pulling the ability for them to even put money away, or <laughs> you're taxing them on the capital gains too, or even to go buy that new vehicle when you're taxing them every every turn. So so would a conservative government get rid of the carbon tax and get yes. rid of the capital gains tax? I don't know about the capital gains tax. Uh, or perhaps... It's not even law yet, actually. Yeah. So it's 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 yet to be voted on. Okay. So until it's... it's, it's, it's which yeah, is complicated, it's, it's right? It's a thought, right? So the, cap, the capital gains uh, issue, I know we did give commitment to the... Um, as far as streamlining the, the tax act mm -hmm. and what was going on there and right now like we we've got different scenarios our, t our tax uh system is just a mess like we've got a anytime a person like there was a, a example of a single mom couple kids she makes a dollar over sixty thousand dollars a year she's all of a sudden working with 20 cent dollars like that kind of stuff has to stop like there's there has to be some kind of you should be always better working you should be always better working. And that for people to really understand that and grasp with it, it's common sense. But yet our, our systems and our tax increases over the years have got us into the system where we're not necessarily that's the case. But our tax taxes, I mean, they go towards roads, they help municipalities, they go towards health care, they go towards education. Mm -hmm. um, which is provincial. Which is provincial, right. Um, but nonetheless, they are providing services for us that normally would be paid for directly by individuals. Yeah, right? so and, and on the health care, so right now we're paying as much for on the interest for the debt that's been incurred by this government than we are in the health care, Canada health care transfers for all of Canada. So that's a problem when it comes to spending. It's putting our social programs at, at risk. So when you got that handcuffs, when you're going into a budget, right? So meanwhile, you got to pay your debts off and you still got to spend the health care transfer, but it's the 50 billion's already gone before you even let out the gate. So where else are we going to do with it? Like where else is the money going to come from, right? So that is, that's the problem with deficit spending. There, there are some other more topical issues and I don't need to get into detail, but things like uh, medical assisted dying. Mm -hmm. Um, a number of social sort of uh, initiatives that have translated for uh, our, our uh, LGBTQ plus communities. Uh, we're looking at uh, how we do things, for example, with regards to our indigenous population, where mm -hmm. we still have so many, even in Manitoba, number of communities that don't have potable water. Yeah. So how, does, how would a conservative government look at, at addressing those kinds of issues? Well, they're... they're I think everyone was, except the First Nations, uh, all provincial, right? Like they, mm -hmm. like the, the, so that would be, like the how, however the province is dealing with that. Um, even um, the the potable water issue is is just the same as you live in rural Canada, mm -hmm. and that's one thing that's really frustrated me. So the the feds and I, I've talked to, we got fourteen First Nations in in this riding, right? talked to numerous ones and they were basically cut out of the rural water systems that were going around all the municipalities which made no sense at all or they came to no agreement right so we've got to circle back around that and see where's our natural advantages like if say for the town of Rossburn say versus way way scapel I'm just because they're two neighbors right yes. there right if they've got a one's got a really good potable water system or needs to improve or the other or if they both need to improve don't make two new systems because one doesn't have it how can they complement each other and we got to get that those kind of barriers down that's what i think the first nations expect that's what the canadian taxpayer expects 
but stop and think about what we have there and how do we take advantage of that versus creating a whole nother new silo of, of uh, you know bureaucracy on on just first nations and well municipalities you can go look after yourself like i think that especially when it comes to rural canada I, we've we, we've wasted and dithered so many dollars in planning and and just include them in the plan and whether you want like the water's there at the curb stop you guys decide when you want it but at least it's there and we've designed a plan for you like I, it is that simple and yet we seem to uh somehow get all wound up and well, well i'm mm. not paying for it right and i think that's where the the federal government could step in and say well we'll pay for it if but at least we'll make the system big enough so we can we can turn around and, and make it work we've hit housing mm -hmm. um we sort of flirted around health care um we've talked about defense uh housing at one point wasn't termed by whomever that it was so much a federal issue but it's become a reality that it's a federal issue right well so, it's not is it is it or isn't it like i, well, I what guess do you think shouldn't shouldn't it be shouldn't that be i don't mean to have total responsibility but there shouldn't shouldn't there be some kind of aspect of housing that is part of a, a federal responsibility well when it comes into the infrastructure part of it like and i go back to the the regulations for water and sewage yes. and things like yeah. that if our country is expected to emit the like, effluent like this is mm -hmm. going to have in it and we're going to go into a, a public mm -hmm. course into water well then the federal government should help out with that i i personally think so but at the end of the day it's federal jurisdiction it's water jurisdiction and it's local i think if you take any tools away from the rms that's very very dangerous mm -hmm. keep the responsibility at the lowest common denominator and that way let the communities figure it out provide them the, the, the channels or the avenues so they can have a conversation. What do they want to be as a community? How many houses do they want? Maybe they don't want any. They're quite happy. Leave them alone then. That's good. That's okay. You're not eligible for any funding because you don't want any funding. Like, mm -hmm. But let them have that and don't, don't cut them out because they don't get any. Like if, they, if they're doing the right thing and building more houses, they should be rewarded for that. Um. One other point that I, I wanted to, to, to talk about, um, and that has to do because housing is a big topic. Mm -hmm. Carbon tax is a big topic. Immigration is a big topic. Yep. So taking a look at our current immigration situation, what is the, the what do you see as, as, as a, a party are the challenges, the benefits, what would you where would you see going forward recognizing a lot of it you have to be in it to actually yeah. do but generally speaking well the immigration system now is a mess and it's um why is it a mess we when the liberals got in there there was a mass like i think there was a statement made like canada's back and we're going to let in anybody we're not going to be like anybody like canada's open for we need immigration right there was no plan behind that there was no housing plan behind that which then spilled over into the the students international students mm -hmm. because then all of a sudden the universities were clamoring or colleges were clamoring for people that would pay double the price of the canadian kid to to get into the same education right so there was a whole host of uh criteria that were just basically ignored and or th thrown out the out the window uh, to bring in this record amount of immigration then they would stick their chest out at the end of the year and say look at how many people we brought into Canada but with no plan no support and and so then you end up backing up a whole bunch of stuff and people get missed right our plan then and so we we get back to the doctors and nurses and, mm -hmm. and uh, um, f professionals right now um, when it comes to um, Right now, when it, it comes to doctors and nurses, there's approximately 30,000 nurses and 20,000 doctors that are qualified in Canada, and they're, but they're not in their profession of choosing. You mean they, 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 they've earned their degrees in other countries. They haven't yeah. necessarily met our, they our, came, came our to Canada, qualifications said, here. Here, I want to be a doctor. And they said, oh, no, you, they, they, don't, they don't recognize the qualifications. Yes. So they end up driving a taxi, uh, working in hotels, 
they're not in their chosen profession where they were trained from in another country. Mm -hmm. So you think about that, 50,000 healthcare workers that could be working in rural Canada, just, just do rural Canada. Um, that, that has to stop. Then we wonder why we have a productivity mm -hmm. problem. So instead of these people working in their healthcare system, they're working being a taxi driver, being a truck driver, right? So that needs to change. So we're, we're talking about on one of our platforms is uh, a blue seal program, like, like the red seal program so for trades. So red seal, you can be a welder, you, you write a test, you get it uh, standardized and you can go be a welder anywhere across Canada. Carpenter, same idea, right? So that's, that's called the Red Seal program. We are, for labor, we are talking about implementing a Blue Seal program for professions. We're gonna start with doctors and nurses. You will write a test over in your country where you started and in six weeks, you'll hear back from uh, the Canadian government say, yes, you've passed your test. You will come to, if once you pass your test, You'll say a doctor in Nipah is looking for, they're looking for doctors. You will sit with a mentor doctor. You come to Nipah, start working day one. Uh, you will be mentored with that doctor. And then say after three months, once you figure out the Canadian system and all that, you'll be practicing here in Nipah and away you go. And you'll have that, that you'll be a doctor landed and working from day one. That would do a massive increase in our productivity just in the healthcare system alone, never mind about the other professions. Interesting. It's good in theory. Have you worked out the actual practicalities? Because there'll be other kinds of things. Different qualifications in different countries, they vary. Yes. So, so the, and that's the, always been one of the challenges is certain countries, it's really fairly straightforward to yeah. get credential recognition. Other countries, it takes a little bit more. Yeah. Would that be part of that process? Yes, to determine? Yeah. so we have to have the, the, the Canadian government has to decide, and the licensing bodies of yeah. Canada have to decide what education institutions in other countries have the similar credentials. So they, they would know going into that school that they qualify for Canada. So there, it, it even instead of them going to a school wasting their money in their own country and then coming to Canada with a false promise and never working in their profession that they thought they were working mm -hmm. in. So it's, it's much more uh, efficient and it's much more uh, rewarding for the people that are actually getting the education mm -hmm. and production in Canada wins. The person that wants to have a productive life and have raise a family in a safe community, they're, they're off to the races, right off the hop, very efficient and then we benefit because we get a, a um, say an immigrant person, but we get the service that we so desperately need. We need people in Canada. We, there's no one denying that we don't need immigrants to, to keep our population up. We, we need it to keep Canada rolling, but they, you know, if they gotta be qualified to be able to do the work. So we'll so give them the tools so they can be. So the inference is you start with healthcare, but that could imply uh, engineering, it could apply, yes. Um, um, all sorts of other yeah. kinds of things, yeah. education, uh, whatever. So yeah. that same kind of approach. Yeah. Okay. Law is the only one that's kind of come up with a little bit of a hiccup, but even then, like, you know, if it's national laws, but that, that's, that can be fixed. But well, I guess even, even if, you, if you established a clear pathway, um, that would be beneficial. Yeah, and I think that's, that's the biggest benefit, Dave. Like, I, I think you're, um, Don, when you you send people that correct signal that Canada wants you, this is how you get to Canada, set the rules out very straight. That's all people want, mm -hmm. is a fair system. And I think as a Canadian citizen wanting, attracting people, that's what I want for them as well. Like this, this setting them up and bringing them into Canada and oh, you just stay there until we get the paperwork done, that's, that's, that's inhumane. Like that's just, that shouldn't happen and yet they seem to, it keeps on happening over and over again. And that's why we, we need change. Um, it's summer. Yes. You're in the constituency. What are your plans for, for here? Well, what do you, what do you yeah. hope to, by the time your summertime comes to an end, and, and includes certainly a bit of vacation in there, yeah. what, are you, what are you hoping to achieve by the end of the summer? Well, I get out in the, so we got like 38 municipalities, 14 <laughs> First Nations, 26 Hutterite colonies. Um, uh, Do you Rod hit every one of those? Uh, 200 communities. Uh, no, 
I can't honestly. Yeah, I understand. Out of yeah, all of them. Uh, no, but we do track, like if I've been at one place three times already, we probably won't get there this summer, right? Um, but in the areas, like we're, we're doing uh, 10 barbecues and three passport clinics this year. Three, I think. And um, so we're uh, like those, we get those out of the way. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really the interaction. What I would really hope to accomplish is everybody that wants to see me gets to see me. I have a good conversation and it's good being back in the riding. That's, uh, it's uh, my favorite time of year is just to get you back grounded and get me re-energized to head back into the fall session. Okay. Well, we're coming very shortly to the end. Um, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, anything you want to say at this point? Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me on here again. I, uh, it's, uh, the job is, um, it's funny, I, 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 I explain it to people, it's, it's kind of got a two-pronged two job, right? Like, there's auto on, then there's the rest of the riding. Mm -hmm. But uh, if anybody does have any other questions for me or anything like that, they can stop in at the office in Nipwa or in Dauphin. Uh, or if you see us, uh, please stop by for a hot dog or if you see my truck. So where's, where's, where are your barbecues going to be um, within this area? I forget. Okay. Nipwa, August 14th. Okay. Yeah, so we go to north south, but so August fourteenth. Yeah, in Nipwa. So, so there will be a barbecue. Yep. Where are you going to hold the barbecue? Right in front of my office. There you go. Okay. Can't miss it. There's no parking. Sure, there is. Right <laughs> beside the chicken chef. Bring them over too. <laughs> well, listen. I thank you very much for taking thank the time. Know. I know it's busy, yeah. but uh, we appreciate the time, and and uh, it's been very informative. And uh, enjoy your summer. Thank you. You as well, Doug. Thank you very much. And for those of you who have been listening, I hope you found some interesting information. You know that if you have further questions, you can reach out to Dan's constituency office here in Nipawa. There's one in Dauphin. Yep, beside uh, the mall there, uh, beside the Walmart okay. mall entrance. And, and uh, don't be afraid. Don't hesitate. Um, he's there to be uh, berated or praised, whichever way you want to go. That's what he does. Working for you. And... Uh, so we're coming to the close, and I don't think we have any more at this point. Nothing more for I you to add. I think we're we're good. I don't. Uh, uh, we've covered the carbon tax. We covered the. I think we're we're getting ready for. I like it's interesting times, right? Like I, yeah. I um, genuinely. I, I, I one one subject that is really still burning at me, and like I, I surprised just how much it comes up is the affordability. There's some awfully worried people out there, and it's mm -hmm. it's it's heartbreaking to see it all kind of unfold as this all goes on. Like the life is getting faster and faster, taxes are going up and up, and mm -hmm. we 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 know we can do something about it. But here we are, we're stuck in this purgatory, well, right? If so you take a look at it, affordability can be applied to almost everything we've talked about today. Yes, and you're quite right. The climate, the emotional climate. Uh, in our country and in other countries, yeah. is affordability is, is, is like critical mass because it's not like it was even 10 years ago no. or 15 years ago. Certainly not. When I was a younger person and growing up, the, the, the potential was there. You could get work. You could, uh, you could get a home. That's not the reality for a lot of people yeah. living in this country today. And the question becomes, why is that the case? Yeah. So yeah. anyway, thank you all for tuning in. Um, we're coming to the end of our program, and uh, if you uh, want to, just get a hold of the constituency office and turn up at the barbecue on the 14th here in Nipawa at in front of Dan's office right on, on uh, Highway 16, and have a great day. Thank you.